Hello, welcome to Chamber Live, the final Chamber Live of 2021 and the final Chamber event of 2021. It's the return of East Lancashire's exclusive network for sales professionals. We call it Sales Club and it's brought to you by East Lancashire Chamber of Commerce and Sales Geek. The views in this webinar don't necessarily represent the views of the East Lancashire Chamber of Commerce, but all facts were believed to be correct at the time of recording, which is the 16th of December 2021. Um, the last couple of years have brought change, challenge, opportunity, but businesses and consumers have never stopped buying and businesses have never stopped selling. Um, in today's session, what's described as the Sales Geek A team, no pressure guys, will be delivering <laughs> an interactive session around how to increase revenue, stay on top of your pipeline with top secret tips, uh, tricks and techniques that have been developed and implemented over the last few years by the geeks. Um, that they've helped their team to grow and prosper in this new normal. And hopefully uh, for you, this will be valuable learning. So by 10 o'clock, we'll all know how to start each client meeting destined for a successful outcome, how to increase deal values, how to double your close rate, and how to ask killer questions that will ensure your client use you and not the competition and will have achieved world peace, we reckon, all yeah. within an hour. Um, so no pressure, no pressure at all. I'm no going to hand over to uh, sales group, uh, sales geek group, sales director Jonathan Finch, and then he can introduce the rest of his team. He's a force of nature. His uh, bio describes him as. See, if you're the sales geek L to A team, does that make you? Are you Hannibal, B A, Face, or Murdoch? Which one would you be, John? I think Hannibal. I'll be Hannibal. Right that. Just yeah, because of the big cigar. <laughs> <laughs> I can see Why that. not? Yeah, um, he's got a real drive in sales and ambition to train the next generation of sales lead leaders. And um, he's got an unbelievable record for conversion rates and increasing your top line. Ladies and gentlemen, to take us through the first part of the morning, Mr. Jonathan Finch. Thank you very much, Simon. Well, very, very good morning, everybody. As Sam said, my name's Jonathan Finch. I lead the sales team at the Almighty Sales Geek. Uh, and a big warm welcome to Sales Club, the final sales club of this year. Um, we were really hoping to do this face to face, but with everything that's obviously kicked off over the last few weeks, it seemed like a much safer option for us all to do it over Zoom. So apologies on that. Shortened it a little bit as well. So we've only got an hour. So we will be absolutely flying through this as quickly as we can. Um, the one thing that I did want to ask you just before we get started, I'll tell you a little bit more about what we're going to be doing today. Um, could you just on the chat box that we've got there, just let me know if there are any specific topics or things that you would like us to cover in next year's sales clubs? We want to make this all about you guys i'm making sure that you're getting the most from it but on the chat box if you could just come up with any topics if it's closing negotiating upselling cross-selling account management anything you can think of drop those on there and we'll download the chat at the end and make sure that we're pulling together some content that is relevant for you guys right without further ado then let me just uh share my screen so some very quick introductions obviously my name is jonathan finch and i'm also got mel horrocks with us today there mel Hello. I'll be handing over to Mel very shortly. Tom, can, are you there live and kicking as well? Tom Crook. Good morning, everyone. Lovely. So Tom's our sales manager. He's going to be running through some stuff as well today. So let me just do a quick screen share. Um, Simon, just give me a thumbs up. Can you see that? Has that come up, the Sales Geek story? Wonderful, wonderful. So wanted to just do something slightly differently really today. And I suppose just run you through what we've done as an organization over the last few years really to, to scale. So... Um, just before I kick off with that, first rule of sales club, you'll have all done this before, and I am going to fly through this bit, but if you can all just take a selfie of yourself, drop it up onto social media, drop it up onto LinkedIn, and tell everybody about sales club. Just say that you're at sales club, first rule of sales club, um, tag Simon in it, tag myself in it, tag sales geek on there, but next year we want to get this bigger and better than ever, so the more noise you guys can make out of it. So uh, if you guys can do that, I'll just keep jumping on. We've only got an hour. So... Um, the reason that I suppose I wanted to just run through this with you is, is, is there's a lot of things that we do in terms, we don't, um, when I say share, it's not that we don't share, but we don't publicly really do events about how we've scaled. Um, as an organization, I mean, we've been around now for just over four years. And in that four years, we've had an absolutely incredible uh, scaling story, really. Um, we've grown from zero to a turnover of, of an OT turnover of one million in four years. Uh, these are just a few of the stats that I'll run through with you. Gone from three staff to 15, uh, designed our and launched our own app and sales community. If you're not on the Sales Geek Hub, I'm sure Mel will be plugging that to you later on. But get yourself on there. It's completely free of charge. Loads and loads of sales advice on there. Launched an online sales academy in the middle of lockdown. Got to say that was fun, difficult, but we got it done. Uh, we've launched a national franchise business with nine part-time sales directors based around the UK. 
And in the last 18 months, we've won uh, quite a few international contracts for clients that are PLC. So we've, we've sort of scaled up the size of organizations that we're working with as well. Now, in order for us to do that, what we've had to do is constantly keep throwing revenue in the front end. There's a lot of different ways that you can scale as an organization, but the easiest one is if you can keep throwing revenue in. Money solves a lot of problems within businesses. If you can put money in at the front end and can sell more, it opens up a lot of doors for you as a business. There's a lot of other things that you can do once you've started plugging things through there. So the aim of today is just for you guys each to leave with three very simple things that you guys can use to hopefully follow in the sales geek footsteps and do the same as we have and to help you scale into 2022. Now, I am going to hand over in a second to Mel, but before I do, one of the piece of advice that I got, and this was about five years ago, it was a friend of my mum and dad's that I went to see, said the secret to business and the secret to sales is very, very easy, Jonathan. Scaling a business is dead, dead simple. Do not overcomplicate it. You've just got to make sure that you have more clients coming into the business than you are losing. Now, that for me was very, very simple advice, but I tell you what, it really hit home with me. One of the things that we often do in a sales role is we're always chasing the shiny. We're always looking for that new client, that new big logo to put on our website. But the key to scaling as well is also making sure that your account management is absolutely on point and you are looking at getting the most out of every opportunity that you already have. Um, at the start of lockdown, we had something that we called Black Tuesday, and it was a very dark day in the Sales Geek bunker, and we lost 70% of our revenue in one day. We were constantly getting the emails, the phone calls from people saying, these again, some of the secrets that we don't, don't publish, um, but seven, we lost 70% of revenue in one day. It should have, in theory, have been the end of us as a business. We didn't have a huge war chest. What we did, though, was we immediately got on to all of the clients that were still working with us, and we were seeing if there was anything else that we could do for those organizations. Within a week's time, we were back above where we were revenue-wise on retainer amounts from previously, but we didn't go chasing shiny new clients going, we need to go and sell more. We went to our existing clients, and that's a key message, really, that has just stuck with me. If, if through over the next few months, you find yourself in a position where you're looking at your revenue streams and going, do you know what? They're not quite where I want them to be. Please, please make sure before you go out there spending loads of money on marketing and chasing that shiny, you are going to all of your existing clients, anyone that you've already been working with. It is so much easier to convert clients that you're already working with rather than going out and chasing other clients. Now, I'm going to hand over to the almighty Melanie Horrocks. Are you there, Mel? I'm here. Wonderful. So Mel is going to run through some stuff around storytelling with you guys. One of the things that we do incredibly well, I think, at Sales Geek is everything that we do within our sales pitches, we relate back to a story. It makes it memorable and hopefully people will come back to that. It has definitely been by far one of the reasons that we have kept getting bigger contracts and bigger contracts. So without further ado, Miss Melanie Horrocks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yes, absolutely. As Jonathan just said, um, one of the things that we do really, really well at Geek is use stories. Now, stories, um, if used effectively, can help make us feel emotions. And emotions heighten our ability to memorize experience um, and experiences that we have and help us improve information processing. Stories make it easier for our brains to store data for later retrieval. And emotions are a signal to the brain that whenever we're experiencing is important. Now, stories, we will talk a little bit more about what they do to the brain, but stories make connections. 63% of people remember stories, while just 5% of people remember statistics. Stories motivate your audiences and stories leave a lasting impression to simplify all the jargon that we as salespeople tell our customers. Um, now, we do our very best at Sales Keep geek to get it right every single time and by doing that we ask ourselves two things or use these next two points every time we tell a story basically and the first one is that we remind ourselves that people do not buy press the button <laughs> people, people do not buy goods and services they buy relationships stories and magic and what we mean by that is that Although people need your product or service, ultimately they are buying you, the relationship, and what you can create for them. And secondly, 
people will remember your stories before they remember your sales pitch. Now, this was said by somebody very, very smart, actually within Sales Geek. Um, and it really resonated with me because people buy people. It is that age old saying. And it's true no matter how far into the future we get and all the technology and absolutely everything. If you sell yourself, you will sell your product. So these two things help us get it right every single time when it comes to storytelling. But what it boils down to, sorry, press the button. I'm not used to not right. having control of the slides. <laughs> sorry, Matt. The keep you out in next slide. Give it the Boris. Yes, absolutely. Um, basically, what it boils down to is that we are absolutely all the same. And if we can look at the human brain and re recognize and realize that we are exactly the same as our customers, as our potential business, those prospects that we're going after, and we can really understand that brain, then we're halfway there to sell into them. Now, the three parts of the brain, a little bit sciencey here, but I'm going to try and keep it light. The three parts of the brain that are super important to reference here are brought up by little images there. So we've got the parietal lobe, which is our center for, it's basically like a big filing cabinet. It's the reason why you remember song lyrics from the 1980s. It's the reason why you can relay information and have no idea where it's come from. It's stored in that big filing cabinet in our brain. We also have there right at the front, our prefrontal cortex, which is known as our human brain. It's responsible for rational, logical thinking, and it is what's known as our true personality. Now, slap bang in the middle is our limbic system. That is our chimp brain, our animal. It's irrational and it's emotional, and it's designed to keep you safe. Every single buying decision that we make as human beings comes from our chimp. It comes from an emotional place. Have a think about the last thing that you bought, whether it was a sandwich, whether it was a sofa, whatever it was, it was your chimp that made that decision. Anybody got any items that they've bought that they can share with us? I'll, I'll go, Mel. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I think the key one for me, and this is the, the thing that this always relates it back, it relates it back to when I, when I bought my car. Uh, when I went to buy my car, I went and sat in it, pressed the right accelerator pedal, it went broom, broom, made a really nice noise. And they let me borrow it for two days. I drove it around for two days and then I drove it back to the garage and I had to sit there and look at my, my Volvo estate that I had, which was rather old and rather clunky and I had to get back into it. And my chimp's there going, no, 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 go, go there, go there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, 100%. And basically, <laughs> this is what we need to understand. We need to understand that once we connect with the limbic system, once we connect with somebody's chimp, we live there, we stay there. Our friends and family live within our limbic system. Our feelings and all that emotion that we feel and all that thrill that we feel when we buy something, our chimp reacts first. Just like a chimp in real life, it is 50 times stronger than a human. And our limbic system is 50 times stronger than our prefrontal cortex. So we need to understand this part of our brain. Our chimp is our fight or flight, okay? Hope that all makes sense. Don't like getting too sciencey. Um, but we need to understand the human brain in order to sell correctly to people. So with that in mind, if we're talking about how important stories are, I think it's only right that I share with you a story. So I'm going to tell you a little story here. It's a story about Dave and Sharon. Dave and Sharon are two cave people living in the Highlands. They live in a cave dug out of a huge mountain called Mount Bagpipe. The mountain is surrounded by huge oak trees and whiskey bushes. As we all know, the Highlands is cold and wet most of the year, but Sharon has done her best to make the cave warm and homely. There are colourful cave drawings on the wall and a shaggy cowhide on the damp floor. There's always a warm fire burning, ready for Dave to return home from a busy day of hunting and gathering. Dave's just come back from hunting and has proudly caught his family a haggis. Does anybody know what a haggis is? Isn't it animal intestines with mints? <laughs> no. A haggis is a small fluffy creature that lives in the highland with one leg shorter than the other so that it can run around the mountains. Obviously. Um, and it they... changes sex every seven years. <laughs> Absolutely. 
<laughs> As they sit down to eat, they hear a noise from outside their cosy cave. And Dave stands up. His limbic system, his chimp brain is in full fight or flight mode. Spear at the ready, he tentatively edges towards the cave en entrance. And on hearing the noise again, he throws his spear. He is in overdrive and he must protect what is his. He hears a scream and a thud and realises he's killed his best friend, Scott, who he likes to go clubbing with on a Friday night. In this moment, he has a choice. Confess what he's done and pretend it never happened. He himself was nearly killed earlier in the day whilst hunting by a kilt-wearing dragon. It could have easily been Scott. He decides that it'd be better to pretend that the dragon got Scott in fear of being banished from his community. He drags Scott out, leaves his body to be found by predators and returns back to the cave with some freshly picked flowers for Sharon. She asks Dave who was at the door, and whilst he returned to his meal, he simply replied, no one. Now, haggis are very, very rare, and there are only about 43% of them left in the population, okay? Now, 34% of Dave's mates think that Sharon is fit, okay? 58% of Sharon's mates think that Dave's rubbish at hunting, and kilt-wearing dragons spend 67% of their time eating ginger biscuits. Okay, so that's my story. Uh, you probably all think I've lost the plot, but I haven't. Because stories do something quite magical to us. Next slide, please, Mr. Finch. Stories help to activate both sides of our brain. Now, if I asked any single person on this call right now to tell me the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, I bet you any money some, someone could. Someone would be able to relay that story to me. But I guarantee the last time you heard it was probably a long time ago. And that's because it generates emotion. We have an emotional connection to the story. Not the words, but the story itself. And from a biological standpoint, stories move us forward in three major ways. They help us relate to one another. They help us make connections between the left and the right side of the brain. And they help us to remember and integrate what we learn. And stories help us to build bridges. When the story ends, the teller's voice is silent, but the bridge between us still remains. And what I mean by that is that once we finish talking to a prospect, they aren't going to remember all the stats and facts and figures and the boring nonsense that we spout at them, trying to sell at them. They will remember how we made them feel. Because facts tell but stories sell. And this is my favourite slide. I, I just don't know why, but it is absolutely my favourite slide in the whole wide world. Um, so we have to story sell. One, one of the things... Go on, Jonathan. No, I was going to say, one of the, the instincts I think that we have as salespeople is when things are difficult and when we're not selling enough, we immediately go to the logical part of the brain and start coming up with facts around why we're better. 96% of our clients would recommend us. 43% of our clients said that we're better than the competition. These things are great, but they're not the things that our clients will remember after that session. And we've had this plenty of times at SalesGeek when we've been bidding for contracts and we've been up against other organizations and other companies. If we aren't memorable, we're never going to win that order. And the key thing for us has always been about finding as much as we can the stories that people will relate back to. When they're in their boardroom a week later, running through the three proposals from SalesGeek and from two other companies, what stories are they going to be able to recall that you've told them? Those are the things that they'll be able to bring up. Oh, do you remember that, that, that thing? Yeah, that they said and they talked about that. They'll be able to run through the stories that they've done and tell them to each other. Sorry, go on, Ma. Not at all. Not, no, that's, it's a really good point. And um, it just relates to right now, this meeting, sales club this morning, in five hours' time, you will have forgotten 70% of what we said to you on this call this morning. But you will remember how we made you feel. We'll, you'll remember, hopefully, that we made you laugh a little bit. We'll, you'll remember that we related to you. And those are the things that you remember. Because people will forget the words that you say, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And I know that that's a little bit fluffy and a little bit out there, but it's true. And that's what we focus on at Geek. That's one of our top secrets that we can give you is to treat people like people instead of pound signs. Because I guarantee your conversion rate will massively change the minute you stop worrying about your bottom line and treat people like human beings. Basically, geeks know how to read a room. We know what we can say, what we can't say, what we should say and what we shouldn't say. We are always observing the people in the room. 
we've all been on Zoom now for, what, 18 months? Feels like a blooming lifetime. But we get really, really bogged down with looking at ourselves. We spend so long just going, oh, what's that? Um, and we, we're not paying attention. We're not observing micro body language and facial expressions, which we have to do. It's the only thing we have on Zoom to do that. So don't, look at, don't be looking at yourself. Don't focus on you. Focus on the other people in the room. Um, next, press the button. Nice. <laughs> um, one thing to remember in, in real life meetings or on Zoom is what my granddad used to say to me. And that is that you have got two of these and one of these for a reason. Shut up. Let your client prospect, let them speak. Make it about them. People are selfish. People absolutely love to talk about themselves and you give them that opportunity, they'll waffle at you all day, just like me. Watch body language and facial expressions. Make sure you are paying attention to those little nods, that smile, those tiny little expressions that can help you when it comes to buying signals. Don't assume anything ask questions ask all the questions don't be afraid that you are going to sound stupid by asking loads of questions if you assume we all know what that does if we assume anything in sales we are making an absolute beep out of ourselves so keep that in mind confidence this is one thing that jonathan has taught me is that if you say anything with enough confidence people will believe you you are being watched as much as you are observing the room. Those people that you are with, they're watching you too. Now, this one is a big one. We've had this here. It was one thing I had to learn when I joined Geek and a couple of other geeks have had this too. Rest in face. Do you know what you look like on Zoom? Do you know what you look like when someone else is talking? Because I didn't. And I tell you what, that was a blooming shock when I when I first saw that back and I watched the recording back and went, oh, my God, is that my face? Watch your face. Oh, Sit oh. in the mirror and watch your face. You do realise that you've got antlers on currently, don't you? <laughs> I'm well aware of that. Yeah, FYI, everybody, the reason I have got antlers and a nose on right now is because Jonathan promised to buy me a pint of whatever alcohol I want <laughs> if I kept this... Um, for the whole session thing on for the entire meeting so there you go and finally one thing that sales geek do is we remove the formal we lower those barriers straight away in a meeting whatever meeting that is whether it's in person or on zoom and with that in mind i think if you press the button there jonathan we've got a little story another story, oh, story about how cool. jonathan finch removes the formal in certain meetings and then hopefully none of um None of the clients that he's done this with are on this call because that would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, one of the things that I, I always struggled with when I first started selling through Zoom, I mean, I'm, I'm a face-to-face -face sales guy. I'm a face-to-face -face sales guy or I'm, I'm a sort of person who likes to be on the phone. And when I jumped onto Zoom, you know, it, it was new. It was a bit different for me. And uh, with all the tips and the things that, that Mel has mentioned before uh, over time that we've looked at, one of the things that I found really good was just to make sure that I had something straight away to talk to people about. Because you jump on that Zoom, there's the, hi, how are you? yes. Not bad. How are you? Looking forward to Christmas? Yes. I'm all, yes. Right. Um, so thank you for your proposal. And then you're straight into the, the bloody eye stuff. What I found was it was really good if you could just lower, um, I think, your guard to start with. And this comes down to that sort of, it, it, not emotional intelligence, but I think if you've got a client on, if you can do something to start with, just take the mick out yourself a little bit. It makes the client go flipping out. This isn't going to be a formal call. This person's a human. And I use, I use the coffee story. Wow. Whenever I... Your antlers, your antlers are another good way of doing it, or Christmas hats. Or, uh, um, but I, I use the coffee store, and when I jump on with someone, if I if I'm looking at them and their body language is a little bit closed off, and I'm thinking I'm going to have to warm this up a little bit, otherwise I'm going to be asking you questions. We have to ask some difficult questions with people about the businesses. Why aren't your sales figures quite where they are? Some of these can seem quite invasive sometimes. This is someone's business, so I use the coffee store to start with. And I jump on, I say, I'll tell you what, I had an absolute nightmare yesterday. I was just jumping on a Zoom call and I had four people that were waiting for me uh, on this Zoom call. And it's quite a big meeting that I got. And as I went to lift my coffee up, just before I pressed the button, white T-shirt, coffee all the way down me to leg it upstairs, chuck another T-shirt on, come back down. Honestly, it was a right nightmare. 
And I use this with people. And most of the time, like, if they slap back, like, oh, oh, that must have been horrendous. I did something similar before. Everyone's got a funny Zoom story that they can tell to each other. The thing that it, it did, does for me, though, this, is it just starts that conversation off really well because I've just taken the mick out of myself a little bit. I've told them about something that I've done that's embarrassing. And it just lowers that guard. I've always found it's a very small tip, but just find something that you've got that you can always revert back to as that opener that you can use on Zoom. I must have told that story. This actually happened to me. It did happen to me. But... I must have told that story probably 40, 50 times now, but it's always a really good opener. When you jump on Zoom with someone, and maybe it's that person that, that you don't know yet, you might have had an email message from them to set the meeting up, but just find a way of lowering that guard to start with. I promise you, it'll make your meeting a heck of a lot easier. Absolutely. Absolutely. Going to have loads of people now, loads of salespeople in Lancashire starting Please. Zoom meetings, telling people that they've just spilled a coffee on themselves. Everyone's just going to think that Lancashire are really clumsy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but give it a whirl. Not necessarily that story, but find your story. Another thing that geeks do is we ask people what their problem is. One of the big things that Jonathan and Tom do, and I know that they do, is they almost make our clients sell to them. We uncover what the problem is in our clients' business. We ask the questions. We don't assume that they just need us. We make them want us. We... <laughs> So I was just going to say the first question that we use in any meeting, Zoom meeting, phone meeting, face-to-face uh, -face meeting, we ask the client, what made you take the meeting with us today? Oh. Even if we, we've set the meeting with them, they've taken their time out of their diary to meet with us. There must be something in their head that they're going, maybe they could help me with that. Our job is to uncover that. But like Mel said, let the clients lead on that. But a really good question to open any meeting with, guys. What made you take the meeting with me today? Absolutely. Don't jump in and try and sell your product. Remember that human to human connection. Remember that limbic system. Remember that emotion. People have to buy us before they buy what we're selling at them. But if we can uncover their pain, that is going to trump everything. Okay. So we have to do that. How do we do that? We ask questions. We ask open questions. What's your biggest problem in business right now? How long has this been happening? What would things be like if this problem was solved? And what would happen if you did nothing? What this does is it makes people feel something and it helps them to imagine that if they don't solve this problem, what their business is going to look like. They imagine their future without using us. And it helps them to want what we have to offer. Once we uncover the pain that our prospects have in their business, we uncover their need. And once we've uncovered their need, we've uncovered our leverage to sell. And basically, once we know their pain, we can paint their dreams. And now this, again, sounds really fluffy and really cheesy, um, but we do love a little bit of fluff at Sales Geek and a little bit of cheese. We absolutely do. And what I mean by this is that nobody cares about the paint. Nobody cares about the brushes or how we get them to where they want to be. They care about the final big picture and they care about what their business will look like once they have used Sales Geek. And that's what we do. We paint them the future. We don't tell them how we're going to get there, but we tell them we are going to get them there. That is what we do. That's the difference. And that's how we sell what we sell. We, we have a piece of software at, at Sales Geek that we use that sits on the back of mine and Tom's meeting. It's a very cool piece of software. Um, and at the end of the meeting, once Tom and I finish, we can go on and we can watch it back. You can search for terms. So I could Tom can jump on my meetings, so I can jump on his. And we, we can search for how many times you might have said the word close, how many times you said the word money, et cetera. <laughs> uh, we, by going back through those and having a look through them, we found that the best conversion rates and the best conversions that we got were always from the meetings where we spent most of our time asking the client and talking to the client about what the end result would be. So a question that we use quite a lot is, in six months' time, if we'd been working with you, what would it look like to be successful? What would we have to do in those six months for you to come back and go, Jonathan, that was incredible. What are we doing for the next six months? And there's normally a pause at this point. The person sits there and goes, hmm. And then they tell us the, the bit that we need to know. What, what is the end outcome that they're looking for? 
a lot of the time we focus so much on what the input is that we're going to do for people. We forget to talk about the outcome, the output that they're looking for. This is one of the key things that salespeople miss, but it's one of the biggest things. If you can spend all of your time in that meeting talking to the client about the end outcome, what it will look like, what it will feel like, you're tapping into that limbic system, they are going to remember you. 100 100 percent and that's the thing that's one of the biggest things like jonathan said that's what we do we make it about that and before we know it we've asked that question what does it look like we've basically said to them what do, what do we have to put in front of you for you to say yes they answer that question we do it we're not going to fly around telling them information that they don't need to know tell us what you want and we'll do it it's as simple as that it's absolutely as simple as that and that brings me on to my final two slides before i hand over to the wonderful uh, Tom Crook, is that geeks always fall forward. No matter what we do, no matter what meeting it is, if it's in person, if it's over Zoom, we have a next step. We never finish a call or a meeting without knowing what the next step is, what we are going to do. There's something in the diary, there is a plan going forward. That prospect, that client does not get off that call until you have something else in your diary to do the next step. We always fall forward. If I, can and, give, oh, so if I can give you one tip for today, guys, and I mean this deadly seriously, when you get off this call, when you get off this webinar this morning, jump onto your pipeline, whether you use a spreadsheet, whether you use a CRM, and go through every deal that you've got in there and ask yourself one simple question. Have I got a next step in the diary with that deal? I can guarantee over Christmas, there's going to be a lot of mince pies eating. There's going to be a lot of wine drunk. People are going to forget a lot of what you've done. Make sure if you've got a deal in that pipeline that you haven't got a next step on, you speak to that client before Christmas and say, listen, when can we get something in the diary for January? I know January is going to be a busy month for you, busy month for us. Let's make sure that we've at least got that next step in there. So have a look through your pipeline today, guys. Please make sure you do this. I guarantee you, if you do this, it will make January so much more productive, but make sure you've got another meeting in the diary that client's got it in their diary you've got it in your diary and you're working towards it even if you're working towards qualifying it out not a problem get it out your pipeline that's great but yep. work towards a next step on there 100 percent. a no is better than a maybe <laughs> absolutely and just to finish with a quote if you aren't moving forward you are falling backwards there has to be a next step in your process. Otherwise, it's going to sit there, it's going to go stale, and it's going to go moldy. So absolutely do what Jonathan said. Um, and thank you very much. I shall pass you over to the wonderful Tom Crook. Well, I'll just give a quick, quick introduction to uh, to Tom, if that's all right. Um, so Tom, uh, Tom, how long have you been with Sales Geek now? Uh, seven, seven and a half months. So just to give Tom a little bit of an intro, Tom's like was seven, uh, seven months ago, absolutely blew us away at interview. It was absolutely incredible. And over the last three months has been kicking at my backside on sales figures. He's coming like an absolute freight train. But we wanted to share with you today, I mean, we often it's often the, the delivery team that do these, or myself or Rich, but Tom has come in and made such an impact. It only seemed fair for Tom to come and share some of his wisdom around how he's kicking so much backside at the moment on uh, kicking my backside on sales figures, but also... Um, pitching and getting out there to some and into some clients which realistically i look kind of go for now wow how have you got into there so without further ado mr tom crook lovely stuff thank you jonathan that's a really really kind introduction as well and i feel absolutely no pressure based on what you've just said either <laughs> um what i want to look at with you guys this morning and it is a real thrill to talk to sales club as well as a, as a salesperson um i want to take three things from my section of today which is to look at how you make yourself stand out how the storytelling that you're going to do makes you seem unique to your clients uh, look at the buying process that you apply at the moment and how ours might differ slightly from yours in an intangible way and what you can do to be a little bit more geek in about managing your buying process and then also some tips for managing that process moving forward and i don't want to give too much of the game away there is a little bit of role play coming now not my plan to do this over Zoom, but we were going to get people, if we'd been live, up on stage and to act out scripts and things like that. I've had to truncate that slightly, so Mel and I are going to take you through some role plays around asking for business and managing customer expectations and getting customers to actually commit to buying and how you walk them through that process in a really ethical, holistic and consultative way. So... Mel was talking about telling stories and how that's really, really important to your clients. If you keep rolling through this, Jonathan, that'd be brilliant. Um, yeah. What's the story that you're going to tell? Well, the story that you're going to tell is how your products and service can be bespoke, 
to your client's particular needs. And if you can't make it bespoke, how is it unique? How is what your business does unique and important to your client? And what is it that that uniqueness allows you to do for them that nobody else can? By finding this and by demonstrating its value to your clients, you're going to close a lot more deals and be a lot more successful in your field. Now, when we ask people what makes their businesses unique, typically on the first training session, they'll come back and say, oh, we keep the customer at the core of everything we do. We're really strong on price. Our aftercare is exceptional. We've got a beautiful website with a slick buying process. The bad news is, is that if you're putting your hand up to any of this, all of your competitors do that as well. None of that is making you unique. It makes you part of the mass of noise that your customers are hearing on a day-to-day basis. You need to zero in on that tiny grain, that little golden nugget that makes you better for your client than anybody else. So how do we do that? Well, for Sales Geek, it's really easy. We make everything that we do bespoke. Our service in terms of what we deliver to clients, the content of our training and our business development support, the, the manner in which we go about delivering our information and our training sessions to our clients, and also the experience that we look to give them being best in class is what we do to make the sales geek experience, for want of a better word, the most powerful for our clients, the most engaging for our clients, and the thing that will bring them back to us time and time again for different levels of service and different experiences with us. It's that differentiation that makes us stand out from the crowd. The value that we bring comes from the feel that we give our clients, not necessarily from the content being markedly different or from being methodology. You know, from a methodology point of view, completely out there or anything too particularly crazy. But the way we go about delivering things and the way we make our clients feel is what allows us to be bespoke and unique. We stand out. We make a ton of noise, whether that's on social media or in the way that we go about doing our businesses. And, and frankly, we simply don't look like any of the competition. Whenever you're ready, Jonathan. All right. Just keep saying next slide, Boris. Next slide, please. Feel like Boris Johnson. There, there, say. Weren't you? say again. He was absolutely enthralled, Jonathan. He was too distracted to press the button. Beautiful. It's, nice, it's nice to see my direct uh, line manager engaged by what I have to say. That's always, uh, I, always I wanted a to, barometer of progress. wanted to shout hallelujah at the end of that, Tom. It's beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely, uh, yeah, ev- evangelistic preaching is definitely a, a side project. <laughs> so we've talked about how you think about making what you do unique and what you do bespoke. How are we going to make your process bespoke? How are you going to make your client feel that they're not just being taken on the standard journey of A, I'm aware of X product, to B, I'm ready to buy it. On the screen in front of you is a very simplistic version of the buying process where A represents a client or a potential customer becoming aware of what you do and B at the end being their decision to buy. The vertical lines along the way represent your typical buying process stopping off points, whether that's exploratory work on a first call, sending out proposals, costing and contracting, and then actually closing the deal and getting that decision to buy. That's all pretty standard, and that's something I think a lot of businesses do on a day-to-day basis. But how do you make that bespoke? Well, for me, it comes in the intangibles. It comes in the areas between those vertical lines where we demonstrate that we are able to get into a client's limbic system, make them feel cared about, make them feel set apart from any other person that might have come across our doorway that day, and it's in that that will make them feel valued. So what does that look like in a practical sense? Well, in between times, I want you to think about things like what are your clients doing on LinkedIn? What posts are they putting up there? Have you got a birthday coming up that you're aware of? Can you send them something to wish them happy birthday? Um, Saw this and thought of you is a great one to send out. And I do this pretty frequently. If I see a video that fits with what a client has told me they're looking for from a training perspective or from a sales directorship perspective, I'll send them a short video or I'll send them an article that I've found that sits within what they're looking for reinforces that you understand what their needs are, but also shows that you're starting to care. Gifts are useful from time to time. Not all the time. Don't overdo it and don't waste tons of budget on sending presents. But one story I like to tell, I had a client recently who, through just conversations with them in the Zoom meeting, much like this, spoke about where they used to summer in France as a young person. I've got family over in France as well. Arranged for a little bottle of wine from that particular region to be sent over and dropped off with them. Got some superb feedback. Really, really great way to interact with your client and show that you're thinking about them so that it's something specific and something that meets, hits their limbic system and makes them feel valued. Super, super important stuff. Next slide, please, Jonathan. 
Uh, just to finish on that, on that, Tom. Sorry, just one thing I, I just wanted to come out. Um, if you can find a way of giving value through your sales process, so even before you've started the contract, and I mean, I've spoken to people before who've sort of gone, oh, no, but they haven't signed yet. I don't want to give them too much. It's like, no, we, we, we give as much as we can during that sales process. Like Tom yeah, said, yeah. if the client's got in contact and said that they're having a real issue with closing, before we even start the contract, Tom will have sent them like, here's three videos off the hub that you might want to use. Here's a, a cheat sheet that you can give your team for closing. Yeah. You think about that. That's what we've done as an organization for that customer if there's two other people or two other clients in that process that they might be thinking about we're, we're straight away ahead in that race we're straight away ahead there's more trust there then they've already got some value who are you going to use at the end of that process the person that you've already used some of the stuff from that you've already got some support from or those two other companies that have run you through and sent your standard proposal if you are just sending out standard proposals to people going on doing a bit of a fact find sending out a standard proposal you're making your life so much harder have a look at your sales process from when you first engage with a client until they first sign the contract what value can you add between that process sorry tom no not at all and just to sort of double down on that what that allows you to become rather than a salesperson in the eyes of your client is a consultant and someone who's there to go on a journey with them, not just to make a transaction and sell them one version of a product. It's someone who's going to be with them through their particular journey. Oftentimes we work with owner managers of small and medium sized enterprises who are super, super passionate about what they do because they founded it from day one. And becoming part of that journey with them is really, really important. Really quick example of, of that in practice. We have a client over in Leeds who do insurance policies for people. And one of their particular segments is arboreal insurance, which is people who climb up and do tree surgery, things like that. We had some training session with them, went really, really well, great feedback. Six or seven weeks later, quick call in the diary just to catch up on how things are going. What did you take from the session? Are the guys applying it properly? And through that conversation, we were able to look at other issues that they were having, gave them a few hints and tips for getting hold of, in a practical sense, people who live and work up a tree during business hours and how they can best do that. And from there, we were able to engage them further and provide extra training for them and extra service along the way. So it really is super, super important to get in that limbic system and to make sure that what you're delivering is that consultative service. Now, promised you all a little bit of role play. Time to deliver on the role play. Luckily for you, like I say, we're not going to drag anybody up on stage. But key to understanding everything that I've just said is understanding the client. What is their process behind what you're doing as a salesperson? What are their processes? What needs to happen behind the scenes after you get off that Zoom call for them to move things forward? Who's involved in that process? You might talk to one or two people at a business, but they may need to take your proposal and your conversation away to three, four, five other people that sit at different levels and in different departments. You need to look at how we establish what their interests are. And also key to understanding your client is looking at their timeframes and their budget. The client's saying to you, I'm super interested in what you have, what you have to offer, but for me, it's not happening for nine months. There's very little currency in driving that sales process forward super quickly. You need to be able to adapt, think on the hop and talk about, okay, well, what does it look like in nine months for you if we don't do this? Are you absolutely certain that nine months is vital? If it is nine months for you, then, okay, how are we going to keep in touch with that client and keep them on the boil between now and then? How do we construct those timeframes so that the client remains engaged with you? Um, you need to be acutely aware of what's going on for them because that will inform your sales process. Uh, don't be worried about questioning your client. We talked about this earlier in, the, in, in Mel's presentation. Questions are your friend. They're going to get, there's nothing at all wrong with delving into the gray areas with client. If you're not 100% convinced or, or certain of what they've just said to you, ask them to clarify. It shows that you're consulting. It shows that you're prepared to pay attention to detail. Never, ever assume. I've got that written in big, big capital letters on my notes. Mel says it, assumptions, if you assume things, you make an ass out of you and me. My granddad used to say assumptions, the mother of all cock ups. So I lean pretty heavily on that as well. Asking questions does another thing for you as well as a salesperson. It prevents you from being too passive. Passivity as a salesperson will kill as many deals, if not more, than being, in inverted commas, a more aggressive salesperson. Because your client can very easily interpret that passivity as indifference or disinterest. So what we're looking to achieve out of these three role plays is to demonstrate super quickly to you why passivity is not a thing you want to adopt as a salesperson, the importance of asking questions and listening to what your clients say to you in those meetings and acting on them. So without further ado, and for the consideration of the Academy, I'd like to bring in Mel to play a role in our first of three short role plays where she'll be the business owner and I'll be the salesperson of varying levels of ability. Then I'm going to call on you guys to tell us what went well, what didn't go well, and ask us some questions. 
These are by no means perfect examples. I really want to drill into things with you and, and hopefully shine some light on what you could be doing better and what you're doing well at the moment. Are you there, Mel? I'm here, Tom. Wonderful. Okay. Are you ready? Have you, did you rehearse last night? Are you off? Of course you, I did. I'm an absolute yeah. pro. Well, sadly, I'm not. I'm going, to be using, uh, I'm going to be using my script just as a little bit of a crutch today. Uh, but, but over to you. Okay. Well, Tom, I think I've got everything I need. Uh, leave it with me. And if we decide to go ahead, we'll be in touch. Okay, Mel, thanks for that. Um, I'll wait to hear from you. And if you want to move ahead at that point, I'll get the paperwork organised. That's the end of role play number one. Anything good about that? Was there anything in there that anyone listening today can say was good technique? I'd be astounded if there was. Really, really super quick, a way of demonstrating that passivity in sales isn't going to get a lot done. I've left myself wide open there. No follow-up call planned, nothing to do with our clients, no real delving into what their pain points are or what works for them. Just, okay, I'll wait to hear from you. Not going to close you a lot of deals. Mel, are you ready for part two? Absolutely. Well, Tom, I think I've got everything I need. Leave it with me, and if we decide to go ahead, we'll be in touch. Oh, great to hear that you're interested. When can I expect to hear from you? Uh, well, I've got a couple of people I need to speak to here. Once I've done that, I'll come back to you with an answer, and we can go from there. That's fine. Thanks for clarifying. Let's set a time to catch up so that we don't miss each other. How's um, Monday at 2 or Wednesday at 9 for you? Uh, Wednesday at 9 works best for me. Brilliant. Okay. I'll send you a calendar invite, and we can catch up at that point. Sounds good. Let's speak then. Okay. So, a little bit more. We've given the client some options, some time to talk to us. We've given them an alternative so that they don't necessarily skip out on the call. Have I asked any questions? Have I really delved into what's going on for the client? Is there anything in the client's language that I can pick up on as a salesperson that would lead me to think there's anything to clarify? I've not got my eye on the chat, so Finji, if there's anything being thrown in there, just give us a shout. Let's, yep, see you uh, we look okay. Right, final part of the role play. Uh, Mel, okay. over to you. No problem. Uh, well, Tom, I think I've got everything I need. Leave it with me, and if we decide to go ahead, we'll be in touch. That's perfect. Can I just say, when you think you've got everything you need, what do you mean? Have I missed something that's crucial to you? Well, actually, I am a little bit unclear on um, X, Y, and Z. Ah, okay. Well, I'm glad you asked in that case. So, X will be impacted by how quickly we can get Y off the ground. And with that taken care of, we schedule an installation with you and have Z up and running as soon as possible. Has that answered your question? And also, what's your time frame for this in an ideal way? Yeah, that's absolutely answered my question. Thanks, Tom. Um, I kind of feel that I want this in the next 30 days. Okay, well, that's more than doable, but there are some things that we need to consider if we work on this together. If you want Z up and running in 30 days, then we're going to need two weeks build time. And prior to that, we need a meeting with your technical team to make sure you have everything you need from an infrastructure point of view. Uh, in order to deliver to your timeframes, though, we'd need to be signing off on this pretty soon. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I think that all makes sense. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, just a thought. Who are the people that you need to speak to on this when you said we'll come back to you? Well, I need to make sure that it sits in budget for the year with our CFO. Uh, if it does, I'll be ready to proceed. That's perfect. Okay. So, based on that, uh, the three-week lead time that we just discussed, uh, we need to be signing off on this in the next seven days to make this work with your time frame. Can you commit to that schedule? Yeah, that's fine. I'm meeting with the CFO tomorrow, actually. Brilliant. Okay, well, let, let's do this. Uh, I'll set up a call with you and the CFO for tomorrow afternoon, following your meeting, so that I can answer any final questions that they might have and help you with sign-off. Are you all right around 2 p.m.? 2 p.m. is great for us, yeah. Okay, I'll set that up now and speak to you then. So just to be clear, we're at a stage where X, Y, and Z are all taken care of, essentially, and what we're waiting for is budgetary sign-off. Yes, that's right. Okay, and then, therefore, tomorrow we'll be signing off and beginning the planning stages of the project from our side. Yes. Brilliant. Okay. Listen, drop me a line if you need anything between now and then. And if not, I look forward to speaking to you at two o'clock in the afternoon. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Tom. There you go. And that draws to a close the rather clunky uh, role play examples that we've given you. Hopefully, um, and again, people can throw this up into the chat. If there's things that we've done well, things that we've not done well, it gives you an idea of the importance of taking what the client says and listening to it and then drawing questions out from there. This idea that there's other people within the business that might need to have sign off on things, um, timeframes, managing expectations are all super, super important. And that removal of passivity is what's going to help you close more and more deals, which takes us very nicely to nearly the end of my part with you guys. We ask for the business. At every stage, 
we're asking for business. Now, it might not be as outright as asking the client to pay straight away after a simple exploratory call, but we set follow-ups, we flinch test on cost, we maintain communication, and we ask, based on A, B, and C, are you happy to move forward? And then when the time's right, we finalize terms and set schedules, and then we close the deal. This is probably the first time, and I'm not really sure because it's all a bit of a, a word to me, uh, that I've said the word close so far in my portion of things. Um, I want you to consider the trope from the film Glengarry Glen, Glen Ross, where they say, always be closing, A, B, C. It's a massive, massive police chain sales. And whilst I don't subscribe to it, particularly from a, 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 a satirical film, what I do think is important is the idea that every interaction with a client is part of the act of closing. If it feels authentic, if you're consultative, and if you demonstrate understanding and confidence that your product is best, all those touch points with your client are an act of closing the deal. It's not just closing at the very, very end stage. Because you've developed relationships, because you've made things feel authentic, you're closing all the way through the process. Last slide, I think. Yep. Okay, okay. just throw, throw all these up, Jonathan, and I'll run through them really quickly. Some takeaways from what I've had to say. Lead the conversation, book the call, keep things moving, remain engaged with your client. Passivity will kill deals for you without you even realizing it. Check in with your client. Are you understood? Have you missed anything that they're saying that's crucial to you? That's going to make it really, really difficult for you to miss things moving down. And the thing that you propose to your client will be far more relevant to their needs. Make sure that you're speaking to everyone and make sure that everyone involved in the decision-making process is aware of your involvement and you're aware of what their needs are. If you know what someone wants specifically from a particular deal, it's far easier to tailor a solution that works for every aspect of the business and therefore get that sign off. Establishing time urgency is important. Is it a priority now, next month, or in the next year? Walk people back from the day they want to have it and set timeframes that work for you and for the client in order to close the deal. And finally, this is my favorite one. Questions are your friend. They give your client the opportunity to talk. They give you the opportunity to learn exactly what they're looking for. People fall into the trap of talking and talking and talking and selling and selling and selling. And this is why we're amazing. And this is what's wonderful. And this is what X, Y, and Z can do for you in an effort to keep control of the conversation. You've got to give that control away to your client because whilst you're talking, they're not. And if they're not talking, you're missing what they have to say. Appreciate your time. That's me done. I think I'm handing over to Jonathan now. Wonderful, Tom. Big round of a virtual round of applause for Mr. Tom Crow. Fantastic tips in there. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, so, guys, we're going to run probably about five minutes over. If anybody does need to leave the session, just uh, feel free to exit yourself. A big thank you for coming along, but I will try and keep this as close to as possible. Um, so, one of the final things that I think has been key, really, to how we've scaled so quickly um, is that we're constantly going for bigger contracts. Now, in the sales world, we call this punching. You might have heard this phrase down at the pub as well, flipping out, that guy's punching, she's punching. My mates say a lot, a lot about me, Jonathan, you are punching, but I like to bring that into work with me as well. And the phrase punching here, we're always punching into bigger clients, into bigger contracts. Now, we've, we've recently landed some clients that we had absolutely... Um, we, we had no real real reason that we should have won them. When we look at the size of the organizations that we're dealing with and some of the logos that we've managed to get on, um, it's absolutely incredible. But the only way that we have done that is by constantly going for bigger contracts. And I see this quite a lot with salespeople and small business owners, that they spend so much time and effort focusing on smaller stuff. Now, if we looked at our revenue streams at the moment, at least 50, 60% of our revenue at the moment probably comes from three or four clients, big organizations that use us all the way across the board for all of their training. So I've just put down here a few tips and tricks for you guys. If you are thinking you want to get into some bigger contacts, into some, uh, some bigger clients, there's some mistakes that I see on a sort of daily basis that I see people making. Number one, they get scared. They get the chance to bid for that big proposal. They get the chance to go and sit in front of that client and they're sat there thinking, oh, I just don't know whether I can do this. The key to think about any big contract is it is no different at all from a small contract. At the other side of that screen, you've got a person who's got a family, who's got their own problems, their own challenges, they're coming up to Christmas. They are a person at the end of the day who's going to make that. There's this idea that in big companies, machines make the decisions and we have to be all corporate. Don't at all. Make a real relationship with that person on the other end. They are the one who's going to be championing it internally, but it is no different from dealing with a small business owner or dealing with an organization that's an absolute PLC. It is the exact same process, so don't be scared. Second one, they go all weird and corporate and use phrases like, it's come to my attention, and as per my last email, I, I wanted to send you over. It just It's a person at the other end of it. Don't do that stuff. Third one on there, they don't honestly believe that they should win the work. 
I think myself and Tom, we are um, optimistically naive, I think is probably the right phrase for it. We think we can win anything. When we go up against some of the biggest train organisations in the world, we're still going, this is ours, we're going to win this. And we don't get me wrong, we don't win everything. People say to me and say to Tom, God, I bet you guys have got like 100% conversion rate. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We're never going to get to that 100% conversion rate. We don't close absolutely everything that we go for, but we do definitely believe that we should absolutely be winning everything. And fourth, they, people try to have everything absolutely in place before they go in, in for the job. So say, for example, I mean, we went for a training client a little while ago and they said, we want some online learning, we want some blended learning, we want access to your academy and we want you guys to do some sessions but we also want you to provide some bespoke sessions for us that we can put on our uh, on, on our, our library, our LMS system. We had never done that for a client before. It wasn't something that we'd done, but we could do it. We didn't let that phase us. We went, yeah, absolutely, we'll be able to do that. I'm thinking we've already done Academy. Uh, we've already done a lot of our own recordings. There's no reason we couldn't do that for somebody else. But don't worry about not having everything in place before you win that job. I think it's Richard Branson who said, if you get an opportunity and you're not sure that you're quite ready for it, take the opportunity and then learn how to do it later. And a big part of what we've done with a lot of these large organizations has definitely been winning the work and then working out how we're going to do it. Don't get me wrong. We don't go see if company comes to us and goes, can you also do IT support? We don't go, yeah, yeah, we can do that. I'll learn how to do it later. That's not our thing. Can't do IT support. I need to speak to someone else on that. But a key thing there is that we are within our realm, we're always willing to, to go a little bit outside of what we'd want to do. Now, I've also put some things here that you should do when you go in and you're pitching for larger contracts. Number one, use your size to your advantage. We have constantly found ourselves in uh, tendering processes with other organizations that are far bigger than us. We use our size to our advantage. One client said specifically to us, a big organization, big PLC, said, we chose you because you were smaller than the other organizations and we knew we would get more support. We know we'd be one of your biggest clients, but we also know that because we're one of your biggest clients, we're also going to get a bigger level of support on there. So use your size to your advantage. Don't be scared that you might not be as big as some of those other organizations who will be bidding for the work. Second, make a personal relationship as soon as possible with the lead contact. Whoever is the driving force over at their end, make sure that you are making a relationship with it possible. A lot of the time we get what's called RFPs sent through to our inbox and an RFP is a request for proposal. So it means a big organization has gone on Google and rather than doing procurement like a smaller company and ringing up and going, I'm interested in buying this, they send you a two page or three page document with all the information they want out of the contract, everything they want it to consist of, or as much as they know that they want it to consist of. Sometimes they don't know what it needs to look like, but they give you as much information as possible. What we do with that information then is immediately try and get a meeting in with the lead person there to have a chat through it. And this is the mistake that a lot of organizations make when it comes to bidding and tendering. They assume that they just have to respond to the formal process. Sometimes you do, sometimes you ring up, me and Tom will ring up and we'll go, no, you have to follow the formal process. But we won, a, we won a deal about 12 months ago with a, a quite a large organization. And they said to us, they said, you were the only company out of all the others who bidded who got in contact with us first to find out and make a relationship with us and find out more about what we're looking for. It gave us so much more information to put into that tender, to put into that RFP. Go the extra mile to get any FaceTime. I've pretty much covered that. Personalize anything that you can for them. Stick their logo all over it. When we're presenting to clients, we stick their logos all over the place. Clients love it. If you've just gone that bit of an extra mile, it only takes you to go on Google, get the logo, copy and paste it onto your proposal. But straight away, they're going, brilliant. You know, this company's really, straight away, they get us. They get us. They've got our logo up there. People love seeing their own logo. The other thing that I'd say with that as well, one of the things that we've done before is go on companies' websites and pull their values down or a bit of information about them. And we include their information in our proposal. It just shows that we've gone a little bit of the extra mile to tailor and to personalize that for that person. Um, number five, ensure you understand what they need versus what they say in their RFP tender. So if you do get a tender, I mean, I'm, I'm going off on a bit of a tangent on tendering here, but if you do get your tendering document through, make sure you understand in there what they actually need versus maybe what they want. There's probably a load of stuff on there that is the shiny bits that we'd like it to have, but what do they need? What are the first things? That's what you want to be addressing to make sure that you've done those. And number six, be yourself. Absolutely be yourself for this process. Sometimes, and me and Tom have been there, we've been sat on a Zoom or in a boardroom sometimes, and we're sat with four or five very formal looking people. I still tell them the coffee story. I still tell them about that story when I spilled a brew on myself and I had to run upstairs and go and get a new T-shirt. That's my story. It's a bit of me. If they don't like you because of those things, because, you, because you've been yourself, you don't want to win the work anyway. 
Because what it'll cause you is a load of headaches afterwards once you've won it, if you're dealing with people who aren't like you. So make sure you are yourself all the way through that process. Um, and I think that draws a close really to everything that we're going to be talking about today. Mel, there's just one final thing that I think you wanted to just uh, quickly run through. Um, I'll leave that one, but uh, I'll, I'll just quickly jump onto the next one. But Mel, uh, I'll let you just finish off and then I'll, I'll say a few words before we finish. Not a problem at all. I just wanted to prove a point. So um, can anybody tell me what the two cave people were called in my story from earlier? Drop it into the chat if you can think about it, guys. What were the two cave people called? I <laughs> see everybody going for the keyboards there. Nice one. <laughs> which, which country did the cave people live in? <laughs> nice. Hi, hi. What were the cave people eating? And what does a haggis look like? <laughs> keyboards are on fire, Mel. Keyboards are on fire. <laughs> Nice. And finally, what did Dave and Scott do on Friday night? Nice. And can anybody remember the statistic around how many of Dave's mates think that Sharon is fit? Nope. My point has been proved, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Stories make it memorable. Stories make people remember you and they will remember the information in a story, but they will not remember the facts. They will not remember the boring stuff. Ah, thank you very much. Well done, well done. Round of applause for everybody. <laughs> uh, so very, very fun thing. Mel, fantastic. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll, sorry, I think I was supposed to put these up as you go. I've been very good on the cooking ever today. Uh, so very finally, guys, just before we sign off, mentioned before, but if you do want to get some more sales tips, sales tricks, uh, scan one of these logos on here. It takes you to the Sales Geek Hub. It is free of charge, our gift to the sector, uh, full of sales tricks, tips. There's loads of good stuff on there that you will definitely enjoy. Um, I think that is absolutely everything from us. Let me just do a quick stop share on there. Um, a huge, huge thank you guys, all of you, for all of your support to Sales Geek and, and to the team all the way through this year. I'm not going to lie, it's been a difficult year. I'm sure it has for you guys, and I'm sure you are all ready for that Christmas break. I know that we certainly are. We're knocking off on Friday, and after that, it is, uh, yeah, mince, mince pies and, uh, and red wine, I think, all the way through, all the way through. But have a wonderful, wonderful Christmas. A massive, can we just have a quick round of applause and a big thank you to Mr. Tom Crook, please? Well done, Tom. Incredible, incredible session. And finally, a big round of applause and thank you to Miss Melanie Horrocks, and also to Mr. Simon Briley for and the rest of the Chamber team for all of the work that they do to pull this together. But Simon, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, thanks, Mel. Thanks, Tom. Jonathan, before you, I'm just sort of looking to, to your left hand side. You've got what looks like some sort of torture implements in in like a black case. No, on your on your left, on your desk there, right in front of you. It looks like it's a plant. No, no, no. Further, further back, it looks like some sort of case with tweezers it's you, it's and tools. Fountain pen. It's my fountain pens. I'm a bit of a fountain pen. Like some sort of Bond villain about oh. to sort of start <laughs> working on someone. I'm really big on my fountain pens, mate. Like, like, I can't use a normal pen. <laughs> I thought it was I'm, for your nails. No, Emily, it's a not for manicure nails. set. Yeah, yeah. We've caught you. We've caught you out. Listen, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for thanks for another interactive and really educational sales sales geek sales club. Um, and thanks also for your support throughout this year. We'll look forward to sales club in 2022. Um, I've got the dates for next year's sales club, which are the provisionally. Um, asterisk terms and conditions apply these days may change uh, 3rd of March 18th of August and 8th of December Simon Rainish do you want to quickly give us 30 seconds on Business Health Matters which is a, a brand new funded programme that could help your business and thanks very much indeed Simon uh, just to uh, make sure that everybody uh, knows that uh, Mel was telling the truth uh, that is a haggis Wild hairy haggis <laughs> from Scotland. There you go. Well done, Mel. Amazing. Okay. Uh, yeah. Business Health Matters is uh, primarily two funded uh, projects, one from Innovate UK, the other from the European um, uh, su um, Support um, uh, Fund. Uh, social funds, sorry, and um, we uh, we are promoting it uh, around uh, the businesses of East Lancashire, not just for the benefit of uh, chamber members, but for all organisations uh, to start to create a strategy 
for health for their employees, which will help them uh, with their business. There are four main areas of health, men, uh, uh, personal health, mental, physical, emotional, and well-being. And obviously you can uh, transfer that uh, to your business as well, because businesses have been going through quite a lot of trauma as well. And the people who are involved and work for those businesses will be going through have, have uh, um, health issues uh, as part of their daily working lives. So there is a, um, a training program at level two and level three for a workplace health champion, which for SMEs is fully funded. And then for a um, fee, there is health screening for employees. Uh, the pr project is being run by Active Lancashire. Uh, to actually make, uh, and that is one of the five trailblazed uh, projects from Innovate UK uh, for better aging health. So it's uh, attempting to find out, and this is a research study as well for Innovate UK and the uh, and for Bayes that um, uh, how businesses and their uh, their employees. Uh, are coping with the pressures of 21st uh, century working. We will be in touch with you very, very soon to actually see what uh, you can get out of the project and how we can facilitate the programs for your uh, uh, organization, for your business. And uh, watch out because we will be using Sale Geeks uh, selling uh, techniques to actually make you convert. So thank you very much indeed for the tips today, guys. Thanks, Sam. And if, uh, if anyone wants to know more about um, essentially funded workplace health champion training in your business at level two and level three, then just get in touch with us and we'll, uh, we'll make that happen for you. Thank you so much for your support throughout 2021. Have yourself a cracking Christmas and New Year and uh, we'll see you at Sales Club in uh, 2022. Take care, everyone.